it's Brittany and I'm back with another episode of Makeup and Murder where I tell you guys a story about true crime while creating a look and this week we are going to be talking about the case of Madeline McCann. This week I'm also going to be trying out a product that I just received and it is the Gucci Silk Priming Serum. This is what she looks like and I'm gonna let you know how I feel about this primer once the look is done, the story is done. So stick around to hear my thoughts on this Gucci primer, y'all. Now, before we hop into the video, I want to make sure to thank everyone who has already subscribed. I am so grateful for you all joining me on this journey. I have reached my 2021 goal in just a matter of days after I said it. My goal was to gain 200 subscribers. I am well past that at this point. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Spread the word. I want to continue growing. If you are just finding my channel, please make sure you subscribe. It means a lot to me. Also, make sure you hit that notification bell so that you get notified whenever I post new content. Now first, before I apply anything to my skin, I'm always going to moisturize and I like using this Saturday Skin Waterfall Glacier Water Cream Moisturizer because it's much more of a gel-like consistency. So it works really, really well under makeup application. So I am gonna apply this to my skin first. And then I'm gonna apply this Gucci Silk Priming Serum to my skin before I apply any of the makeup as well. It smells really good, but it does have a more prominent fragrance to it. So if you are adverse to any type of fragrances or scents, um, especially on your skin, if you have that type of sensitive skin, I would probably steer away from this, but the smell is really pleasant. So if you don't have any bad reactions to scent, this is a great smell. It doesn't bother me at all. Okay, so just a little background on the McCanns and how they got into this situation in the first place. The McCanns, specifically the parents, Kate and Jerry McCann were both physicians and they met in medical school. And after they both completed medical school and residency, they got married in 1998. I am just going to take my Maybelline ultra thin brow pencil and fill in my brows. So after they got married, they decided that they wanted to try to have children and they had a really hard time conceiving. So they went through multiple rounds of IVF. And finally, after you know repeatedly trying, they got pregnant and along came Madeline. Now, after having Madeline, Jerry and Kate got pregnant again which it tends to happen a lot, it seems, with people who get pregnant the first time with IVF. Um, it was really hard for them to conceive the first time, but the second time, it was a, a bit easier to conceive once, I guess, you get the ball rolling with the process the first time and your reproductive system is going. But either way, shortly after having Madeline, they got pregnant with twin boys. So at this point, they are married with three children, one older girl and two little boys, and they are going on vacation to Portugal. Now, this family is from the UK and they're going on vacation with friends and their children to Portugal. And specifically, the place that they are going to is Praia de Luz. The name of the place that they were staying at was the Ocean Club Resort. They went on vacation to the Ocean Club Resort with three other families and these three other families also had children as well so when they got there they requested to all be roomed in the same block so kind of the way that this resort was laid out was it was not kind of like an enclosed resort where you have like a lobby of a hotel that you walk into and then you go up into your rooms or anything like that it was more so like there's one building that's kind of like the main central area. And then there's a bunch of apartment buildings within this Ocean Club Resort where you basically are staying in, a, in an apartment 
for the time of your vacation. There are also people that are living in the apartments as well, which is a little bit strange to me, but I mean, make your coins however you need to make your coins. So that's kind of the dynamic of this particular, you know, type of lodging. They had all requested to stay in the same block of apartments so that they were all in the same vicinity. And also they had planned on the adults eating together every night at the same restaurant. So they made sure to request that they have rooming where, you know, they could see the restaurant visibly from the apartments and the other way around as well. And this is gonna be important throughout the story. Now I'm just gonna take a little bit of my Wander Beauty gel for the brows and apply it so they stay in place. And then I'm also gonna take my NARS Soft Matte Complete Foundation and this is in Cafe. And I'm going to clean up the brows with this. So the plan was that all the adults, you know, had agreed to was to every night, put all the kids to bed by 8.30. And they had a standing reservation at the Tapas restaurant that was within the Ocean Club Resort. And every night they would all go eat together once they all put the kids to bed. Now, I got a whole lot of problems with this whole process as a parent, and let me tell you why. So their plan, they were going to put the kids to bed they asked the restaurant to always seat them to where they can see their apartment, their apartment block, since it was literally a minute walk away or so. And the plan was to have one parent every 30 minutes go back to each apartment and check all the kids while they were sleeping. Now, they left all of their children in an apartment in a strange place every night to go eat and have some adult time with the doors unlocked because they thought it would be easier to quickly access the children. Now, this has nothing to do with victim shaming, parental shame. Like, that was just wrong. Like, that's a bad idea. I, as a parent, would never, ever ever say oh they're sleeping I can walk back to my room and I can see the apartment building so I'm just gonna leave my kids sleeping kids that cannot defend themselves they were three and two or something like that sleeping in an in a room by themselves doors open doors unlocked like, who said that was a good idea? And on top of all this, the resort themselves offered babysitting services, a whole facility of after hours childcare, anytime childcare for when the adults wanted to have some adult time or some alone time while on vacation. But all of these parents thought that it was a better idea to leave their kids alone in an apartment with the doors unlocked in a foreign place so that they could go eat dinner. Make it make sense. I Make it make sense, please. And it seemed to be fine. And they seemed not to have any issues up until this night, May 3rd, 2007. So at about 10 p.m., they have been eating since about 8.30. So there's been two other parents that have gone to check on the kids, all the kids, not just their own kids. But from what the other parents said, when they were going to check on these kids, they were mostly just walking into the apartment itself and kind of standing at the door of where the kids were to make sure nobody was making any noise, meaning nobody was awake and stirring and needed something. But they weren't actually physically looking to see if the kids were still in the room. So at about 10 p.m., it was Kate's turn to go check on all the kids. So she goes into her apartment and walks into the room and 
She sees the two twins sleeping in their pack and plays, but immediately notices that Madeline is not in the bed. Madeline is not only not in the bed, but her lovey is still there. The little, you know, stuffy stuffed animals that usually have a little blanket or something hanging off of it. Um, her lovey is still there. And so is her security blanket that she takes everywhere with her. So immediately Kate thinks she didn't just get up and leave. If she was going to look for mommy and daddy, she would have taken these things with her and she panics. She also notices that the bedroom window was open. She felt a breeze and realized that the window was open, but they had not left the window open when they left the kids. So now I'm going to take my Fenty Pro Filter Eye Primer and I'm just going to prime my lids. So Kate, as soon as she sees this and she's running around the apartment and she cannot find Madeline, she runs back to the restaurant and, you know, she tells everybody she pretty much is in a panic at this point and she just screams, they kidnapped her. They took her. And immediately everybody panics. So everybody starts looking for her and they call the police. So now I'm going to use my Jackie Ina palette along with my Visart matte palette and create a nice pink and purple-ish eye look. And I'll be using from the Jackie Ina palette, I'll be using Supreme Pinker Wigglies and a little bit of Shookington and Trust Issues. And from my Vise Art palette, I'll be using this darker pink here. So when police arrive, they talk to Jerry and Kate, and then they also talk to the other parents that they were eating dinner with. So Jerry is talking to the police and he tells them, we went to eat at 8.30, we left the kids sleep, unlocked doors in an apartment, and every 30 minutes, one of the parents went to check. So at nine o'clock, one of the parents went to check. But again, he didn't physically go in the room to make sure that the kids were physically there in the beds. And Jerry, for some reason, felt uneasy about that. That's called an intuition, a parent's intuition. Maybe you shouldn't have left your kids like that in the first place. But he said five minutes after he, the first parent checked, he went to check his own kids himself because he felt a bit uneasy and he went to physically check and make sure that his kids were in the bed in their apartment and they were at that time so another parent went to go check at 9 30 and then at 10 o'clock it was kate's turn to check the kids and that is when she discovered that madeline was missing and Kate mentioned that she also noticed that the kids' bedroom door was open slightly more than they had left it. They usually left it cracked so that you'd be able to peek your head in and make sure everything was okay, but it was open a bit more than what they had left it, along with that window being open and a breeze coming in. So after the police talk to the McCanns, they also talk to the other parents that were there. And one of the parents' name was Jane Tanner. And Jane was the one who went to go check on the kids at about 9.30ish. And Jane mentioned that she was walking towards the apartment block when she saw a man who was dressed in a jacket, some pants, and had dark hair and he was carrying a sleeping child and it appeared to be that he was carrying the child away from the apartments and she really didn't think anything of it at the time she thought it was just another parent kind of carrying their child away but afterwards with madeline missing she thought about it and he was actually walking away from the apartments as she explained it Jane also mentioned that the girl that he that she saw carried by the man had similar pajamas on to that of Madeline and also that she was barefoot, which is strange to be carrying them away from the apartment building with no shoes. Now police go in to examine 
the apartment where Madeline McCann and her family was staying. And Kate had told them that, she told them that both the windows and the shutters were open. But when they walked into the room, the only thing that was open was the shutters and it was just this much open. So they walked into a completely different situation than what was explained to them by Kate. So initially the police felt like they had no evidence that there was an actual abduction or kidnapping, but there was a very real situation of a girl, small child missing and they needed to find her. So the McCanns instantly start to reach out to all media outlets and they push to get the story run about their child all over, you know, the news, papers, all of that. And it happens. Why? Because she's a little blonde haired, beautiful little white girl. That is unfortunately the privilege that people like that have. So they use their privilege to find their daughter. The police also start canvassing the area. So they are talking to everybody from, you know, employees that work at the resort. They're stopping buses and searching buses for the little girl. They are pulling out all the stops, especially, you know, it being such a small little like fishing town. They are pulling out all the stops to try to find this little girl. And of course, all the while the McCanns feel like they are not being involved enough by the police in the investigation. They are not being told anything, which are all typical things that police officers do and detectives do in the process of investigating any case, regardless of who you are, how wealthy you are. But of course they felt like they were not being informed enough about what was going on. So they decided to hold their own press conference the very next day. So now the very next day after they hold this press conference, they get the privilege of having the UK interject themselves in the case. Now, I am not aware or I haven't seen where a police force from a completely different country are able to interject themselves in a case in a whole nother country without being asked to join the task force. But again, because these people were not poor people, because McC Madeline McCann was who she was and looked the way she looked, all of these things were allowed to happen. And that is not to say that, you know, she didn't deserve the best investigation, but the truth is every missing person, every missing child deserves the best investigation, not just those who look a certain way, not just those who have a certain amount of money or maintain a certain lifestyle. Now also a man named Robert Murat, who is an expat, Robert, Mira decided that, you know, hey, I speak fluent Portuguese. I also speak obviously fluent English, so I can be of some service. So he interjects himself into the investigation to be a liaison or a go-between between the McCann's and the police in Portugal. So they just have all this help to find this little girl within two days of her going missing within the first 48 hours. Now, police also get a tip from a man named Martin Smith. And Martin tells the police that he also saw a man carrying a child that very same night that Madeline McCann went missing. He tells the police that as he was leaving the same restaurant, he saw a man carrying a child that fit the description of Madeline McCann, who also had on pajamas that fit the description of Madeline McCann. And they mentioned that, he mentioned that this man was a white man and had dark hair and did not look like a tourist at all. So this sighting seemed to line up with the same sighting that 
their friend Jane Tanner had reported to the police the same night that she went missing. And now I'm just going to apply some magnetic lash liner. Y'all know I don't use lash glue. It's not for me. I don't like it. If y'all have techniques, make sure to share it down below. But in the meantime, I'm going to put on my magnetic lashes and keep the ball rolling. Okay. Just 10 days later, Robert Murat, the man who had interjected himself as a liaison between the police and the McCanns, he is started to be reported in the media as a suspicious character. So the police decide that they are going to go and they are going to search the home of Robert Murat. So they tape off his house, block off his house, and they tear it up. They search everywhere for any type of information, evidence that he was involved in any way with the disappearance of Madeline McCann. They also bring him down to interview him and ask him questions. And I, they grill him. They grill him for 19 hours. And essentially, there is no evidence. There is nothing but basically a hunch or inkling that he may have been involved because of the strange way he interjected himself into the case. But there was nothing for the police to hold him on, so they had to let him go. So the McCanns decide, you know, we need to keep this investigation going, so we need to raise some additional funds. So they start a fund to actually keep the investigation funded in Portugal. They also start a website where people can join, go on the website and share any tips that they have or any information that they have that may be helpful to the investigation. Now, once they set up this website, the tips start to roll in. There are sightings all over the world in 42 different countries. There are sightings, but there were some really credible sightings in Morocco. And that is because Morocco is just a couple hours drive um, from where they were in Portugal. So it was feasible that whoever may have taken Madeline would have driven into Morocco to escape. And then when they talk to the woman who reported the sighting in Morocco, she tells them that she saw them in a gas station and it was a man with a little girl that looked like Madeline McCann. And in Morocco, someone with blonde hair, fair skin would have stood out. So they definitely noticed her and she was with a man and she did not look happy to be with the man at all. And the woman reported that she heard the little girl ask the man, can, can we go see mommy now? So, of course, they deemed this as something that was viable. So, the McCanns took a trip themselves out to Morocco to see if, you know, the sighting was viable because there had been multiple other sightings in Morocco as well. So, they thought this was their best chance to get their daughter back. They went to Morocco and ended up with nothing. They couldn't verify any of the sightings that they had seen. Y'all see how easy that is? <laughs> and all I do is press to make sure that the magnet is on. That's it, sis. So really quick, I'm just going to color correct with my Born This Way by Too Faced Concealer. And this is the Mahogany. And I use this as a color corrector because it's very orange and that's the color that I need to correct my dark areas. So now let's really quick jump into the prime suspects that they had, the first prime suspects and so forth. So while the police were doing the proper investigation, they brought in two dogs from the UK. And they were essentially cadaver dogs and blood dogs. One was a cadaver dog, one was a blood dog. And when I say blood, it was trained to only detect human blood. 
not animal blood, nothing else but human blood. So they brought in these two dogs and I love, love, love the use of like super animals. I'm a dog lover. They had the cadaver dogs first go through the apartment that they were in. So when the cadaver dogs went into the apartment, they alerted on a lot of different areas. Next, I'm going to take a little bit of the Marc Jacobs. This is their gel highlighter, and this is in the color Tantalize, and this is the coconut gel highlighter. And I'm just going to put a little bit under in these areas under my foundation, just to give me, again, a natural glow, not that artificial glow when you put the highlighter on top. And I'm gonna spray a little bit of setting spray onto my stippling brush so that this highlighter stays in place once I apply the foundation. The dogs, like I said, they alerted on a couple different areas in the apartment. And one of the areas that they alerted was in the McCann's bedroom. So this is the parents' bedroom is where the dogs originally alerted. So specifically, Eddie, who was the cadaver dog, alerted like near the closet where the parents kept their luggage during the vacation. So he alerted there first and then they took him out into the main area and he alerted near the sofa. They moved the sofa. He alerted on the floor behind the sofa and also on the curtains, near the curtains behind the sofa. And then they brought the other dog who was the blood detector in the same area. And she also alerted on the floor behind the sofa. So it's looking real bad for the parents of Madeline McCann. They also took the dogs to the parking garage that had the car that the McCanns had rented for vacation three weeks prior, along with 10 other cars in the same area. So they took them to this parking garage that had these 10 or so cars. And the only car that both dogs alerted to was the car that the McCanns had rented during their vacation. And specifically, Eddie, the cadaver dog, alerted near the trunk of the car and then also at the lower part of the driver's door on the car. And then the blood dog also alerted to that same spot. So just a whole lot of just not looking real good for the parents. So this instantly led the Portugal police to believe that the parents may have killed the daughter or something happened accidentally that caused the daughter's death. And then in a panic, they put her in the trunk of the car to dispose of her body. So now I'm going to take my Bobbi Brown and this is the Skin Long Wear Weightless Foundation and this is Oil sh Oil Free Shine Control with full coverage. So now I am going to take two concealers and I'm going to use the lighter one which is the Smashbox 24 Hour Studio Skin Concealer. And then I'm also going to use my slightly darker NARS and this is the creamy concealer. And I'm gonna use the lighter one to brighten right under my eye and then kind of blend that out into the darker to make it look like a more natural under eye. But they, the police also start to ask, you know, why were the twins still there and sleeping through all of this? And in fact, the twins stayed asleep even once all the other people got in the apartment, once the police came in the apartment. How? How were these babies still sleeping? Also, how did no one, you know, hear Madeline make a peep whatsoever? So these questions started to come into play and it was revealed by the grandparents that the McCann's had actually used sleeping medication to get their kids to sleep. Before they had ever gone on this trip, they had been using it because apparently Mad Maddie was a colicky baby and they all, all the kids apparently had trouble sleeping. So they used sleeping medication 
to get these kids to go to sleep. And this trip was no different. They used some sleeping medication to get the kids to go to sleep. And apparently the night before, they were having a whole lot of trouble getting them to sleep and they had cried for three hours straight the night before. Now, this is where the police start to think, well, did they accidentally give Maddie too much and she got dizzy and affected by it and fell and hurt herself behind the couch where the dogs alerted and then the dad panicked and put him in, put her in the trunk of the car. Is that what happened? Or, you know, anything like that now that they know that they use medication to get their kids to sleep. So now once this happened, child, everybody is against the McCann's. Everybody is against the McCann's, except for the friends that they had and the friends that were on the trip with them. They just couldn't, you know, bring themselves to think that the McCann's would have done something like this to their, you know, child, the child that they went through so much to conceive and they thought she was such a special little girl. They just could not see the family doing anything like that to Madeline. But the media did not care, child. The media or the police. Like everybody is all of a sudden, you know, now they're like, wait, so who thought it was okay to leave the children by themselves in an unlocked apartment every single night so that y'all could have adult party time? Like who thought that was okay? And, you know, stories started to come out like, well, they are swingers and they didn't want the kids interfering with their, you know, swinging events. So they drug the kids to make sure that they can get their swing on after the 8.30 dinner. And, you know, of course, none of this was actually true as far as we know, but these were the things that were, you know, coming out of the media now that they learned, you know, the dogs have alerted and they give their kids medicine to go to sleep, that kind of thing. So after all this takes place, the McCanns have to make the unfortunate decision to go back to the UK without their daughter. I am going to take some of my Laura Mercier setting powder in translucent medium deep and I'm going to set my concealer. Now, a lot of people felt like the McCanns like basically fleed Portugal because they knew that, you know, the police didn't have enough to arrest them at the time. And if they ever wanted to file charges on them, they would probably have to ask for extradition to get the McCann's back into Portugal. So that's what the media was reporting that they kind of fled, but they just needed to go back and just try to, you know, they still had other children. They had family. So they still, they had practices that at some point they just felt like the decision was best to go home. Now, in the meantime, the police tear the car apart that they rented and they tear up the tiles on the floor behind the couch that the dogs had originally alerted on. And they send it all for DNA testing and they send it, of course, to the UK labs because they're more advanced and they send them there for DNA testing. And basically, Everything comes back as not having any DNA on it that belonged to Madeline McCann. So when, you know, they were originally questioned, the McCanns themselves, about what was going on, Kate pretty much clammed up and basically said, you know, per the advisement of her attorney, that she wasn't going to answer any more questions once they started to treat her you know, as if she was a suspect. But Jerry, on the other hand, he wanted to be as helpful as possible, like regardless of whatever his attorney was telling him, he wanted to be as helpful as possible. Now, I say it all the time, listen to your attorney and don't be talking to no police without an attorney present. Like that's just not a good look for you. I don't care if you're innocent. I don't care if you're guilty. That is just not that's not the move, sis. That is not the thing to do. So, but he did. And he was just trying to be helpful. And he told them, like, look, you know, we had, you know, dirty diapers in the trunk. And we had dirty diapers in the car. And we had, you know, meat that we bought in 
the meat must have dripped the blood out of the package, etc., etc. And the police, you know, this is why you don't speak to them, you know, without an attorney present. They're like, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense because the dog only alerts on human blood. So she wouldn't have alerted if it was beef blood, chicken blood, any other blood, only human blood. So it didn't help him to talk to the police in any way. But they send the stuff off, they get results that are not favorable to the McCann's being responsible for their daughter's disappearance in any way. So basically they have to drop all suspects. They also have to drop Robert Murat as a suspect. They have nothing against him either. And essentially they have to close the case in Portugal. Now the McCann's, when they went back to the UK, they were lobbying really, really hard to get the UK police to open up Madeline's case there. And again, their privilege showed because they were able to get in contact with the government and all the higher ups in the government and, you know, the attorney generals and those type of people. They were able to get the ear of those people to ask their government to open the case for their daughter, to find their daughter. And it worked. Of course it worked. And now I'm going to remove all the excess powder. While they are trying to pressure the government to open the case in the UK, Kate decides that she's going to write a book and she writes a book about the personal experience of, you know, this whole process of the investigation of her daughter going missing and all of that. And at the end of the book, which becomes a bestseller, at the end of the book, she, you know, has a, it's kind of like a call to action for parents and people reading to, you know, join them in lobbying the government to open the case. And of course they do. And the government concedes. So the case gets opened in the UK. And not only does the case get opened in the UK, honey, they get Scotland Yard, the new Scotland Yard's best detectives, best teams of 28 people on this investigation. So this was in 2012, five years after Madeline disappeared. The case gets reopened by the Scotland Yard. And when they jump into this case, they pour over the case, um, the case file from the Portugal police. And they find a lot of errors were made in the original investigation. I am going to take my Revolution Glow Bronzer. This is their Splendor Ultra Matte Bronzer in Deep. And I am going to bring some life back to my face with a little bit of contour at the same time. So the first thing that they find wrong with the investigation of the Portugal police is that by the time the Portugal police got to the actual scene, it was already contaminated by so many people. The family was in there. The friends of the family that were eating dinner together was in there. You know, people trying to help find her were in there. Just, it was a mess. Like, there was no possible way to get any evidence that would have been admissible in court from that apartment. The second thing that they find is that nobody bothered to check phone activity for the area during the time where the abduction was supposed to have taken place. Nobody checked, you know, phone records of the people that were in that area. Now, it was feasible because it was such a small town. There was not a ton of people in the town and it was mostly tourists. And them saying that, you know, the person that they saw was definitely not a tourist. Checking the activity of, you know, phones of people who were not tourists in the area for that specific night and that specific time would have been pretty easy to do, but it just was not done. I'm also going to take a little bit of my bronzer and shape my nose with it just a smidge. And the last thing that they found is that there were a number of sketches that were done that of the, you know, person that was cited that they just never bothered to follow up with. 
and they being the Portugal police. They also went back to, you know, question all the people that worked at the Ocean Club Resort while the McCanns were there. And what they find out is crazy. So they find out that there is a book, kind of like a guest book, that's always open on the counter for anybody that wants to see it to see it. And in that book, it specifically said that the McCanns and the three other families that they were with wanted a standing reservation at the same time every single night. And they wanted it to be in a place where they could visibly see their apartment building or their apartment block because they have sleeping children at home. And anybody could have walked in and saw that information. It was just sitting there. Now, they also talked to a couple of different witnesses when they went to go re-canvas the resort. And one of them was a 12-year-old girl and she always watched the apartment that they were in, which was apartment 5A. And she always watched that apartment because her grandmother used to live there. And she said she remembered seeing a guy kind of hanging around and watching the apartment. And there was a number of other people who reported the same thing, seeing the same thing happen um, several times, the same apartment. And there was also another woman named Carol. She actually lived above that specific apartment. And she said she was having her afternoon tea, y'all. And when she was having her tea, she noticed a man that was creeping and sneaking out of that apartment below her and, you know, sneakily closing the gate behind him as to not be noticed when leaving. Now I am going to take my MAC Glow Play blush and I am using the color Rosie Does It. Now, police also find out that around this time, there was a whole lot of burglaries happening in this Ocean Club Resort. And in fact, just a few weeks before the McCants got there, the lady above them had an attempted burglary and there was two other burglaries in that same vicinity just weeks before they came there for vacation. So now in 2014, and this is two years after the investigation started in the UK. There were three men who by phone records were near where Madeline McCann was abducted between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. that night. Now, these three men, they worked at the club, but they were known criminals. See, I have a problem with that too. So why are y'all employing people at a resort and it seems like a you know uppity resort for wealthy people but why are you employing these people and you know they're known burglars when y'all have ample places to burglarize like okay and the police pull these three in to talk to them about obviously the disappearance of Madeline McCann and they talk to them and they say, you know, we had nothing to do with it. It was just a coincidence that we had phone activity in that area at that time. They were technically employees there, but the police still had nothing to hold them on and they had to let them go. There was nothing to link them to the case of Madeline McCann. So now the next thing that the police do is they go and talk to the police. They go and talk to the people that worked at the babysitting service because they had two sightings of men carrying a small girl in their pajamas either to or away from the apartment block and when they talked to the the babysitting service employees and they talked to the actual parents that were there at that time there was a father who came forward and said yes i picked up my daughter at that time I carried her in her pajamas and no shoes back to our apartment. So they actually tied that back to the sighting of Jane Tanner, but we still had that sighting of Martin Smith that was not the same man. It was not at the same time. So his sighting still seemed very credible in the case of Madeline McCann. Now I'm gonna go back in with a little bit of this dark pink and I'm just going to 
smoke out my under eye just a smidge. So they went back to Martin Smith and they talked to him about what he saw and he was able to give them a very, a very, very detailed description of the man that he saw that night carrying the little girl. And he mentioned that the man definitely looked awkward carrying the girl. So he didn't look like a dad that was used to picking up his sleeping child and taking her to bed. He looked like he had never carried a child before. So they created this sketch based on his description. It's been two years, almost three years. And, you know, the Scotland Yard, they've gotten some leads, but they're still not there yet. And the public is starting to worry about the amount of money that they're spending for this one girl that is missing. They have spent 11 million pounds on this investigation for this one little girl that's missing. And I completely agree that every little girl that's missing is important, but that's the point. Every little girl that's missing is just as important as Madeline McCann and the public just could no longer justify their government spending millions on the disappearance of one little girl. Again, it's all because of the privilege that you hold when you make more money and the privilege that you hold when you are not a minority. So in 2015, the police end up scaling back the investigation team from 28 people down to four people. And at that point, the case just kind of slows down in the UK and goes pretty cold. Now I am going to take my Man Eater mascara and I'm just going to blend my lashes in with my falsies. And then I'm also going to make my bottom lashes pop. Now I am going to take my NYX suede pencil and this one is the color vintage and it's like a dark purple wine kind of color. And then I'm gonna take my NYX soft matte lip cream and this is in the color frog and I'm gonna do a little bit of ombre lip for the girls now this past year so in 2020 we finally got a break in the case so this is five years later and the break actually came in Germany there was a, an investigation going for a sexual predator by the name of Christian Bruckner and Christian had sexually assaulted a little girl in Germany and then fled to Praia de Luz in Portugal. And then in Portugal, he proceeded to sexually assault an elderly woman. And after he sexually assaulted her, he beat her with a metal pole and fled. Now this attack in Portugal happened just two years before Madeline was abducted. And even before that, he had attacked a woman who was living in Portugal in her first floor apartment. He sexually assaulted her and he actually filmed the attack. Right after Madeline McCann was abducted, he fled back to Germany where he continued to rape and assault elderly and small children. So when he went back to Germany, he set up like a little kiosk or like, I guess, similar to like a newsstand, but that's what he ran and it was placed strategically right next door to a kindergarten school so that he had, you know, access to all the small children that he wanted because he was a clear pedophile. They had records of him in, you know, those underground pedophile chat rooms, just saying things that I would never dare repeat because it's just so despicable the way he thought about children. And he always made sure to keep a teenage girlfriend as well. So hello, pedophile. And he made sure that he, you know, beat his teenage girlfriend constantly. So he was a violent pedophile. He was very sick, very despicable. And he would talk about, you know, how he wished that he could, you know, build a dungeon and do whatever he wanted in his dungeon. The way that he was initially linked to the Madeline McCann case was the McCanns appeared on a German TV show 
and they were talking about you know the Madeline McCann case their missing daughter and there was tips that came in after their appearance on the show and the best tip that they got was someone who just identified the sketch that they showed during the show and they clearly identified the man as Christian Bruckner now he was also being investigated for a number of other different crimes that he committed against women and children and he was found to have a abandoned factory that he somehow owned and in this abandoned factory they found buried under his dead dog was a collection of hard drives you know other digital storage devices um, anything you name of take all that of his crimes of pedophilia you name it he had it and it was hidden under his dead dog's body now in 2017 the McCann's show from 2015 was re-aired as an anniversary re-airing in Germany and at this point is where they really got a lead when friends of Christian Bruckner called in to the police and said he has admitted while drunk that he was responsible for you know the disappearance of Madeline McCann amongst other things that he confessed to. I'm going to take my Milani Make It Last setting spray and just spritz the face. And finally, in June of 2020, the police come forward. They come out and they say that they are investigating Christian Bruckner, so they name him as their number one suspect in the Madeline McCann case. Now, when asked, obviously they can't say the information that they have, evidence that they have that ties him to the case because it's an ongoing case, but they definitely say that they have sufficient evidence to tie him to the case. So whether it be, you know, something that they found in those videos, if he took videos of him attacking or abducting or assaulting Madeline McCann, they have some type of tangible evidence that not only is he responsible for the disappearance of Madeline McCann, but he is also responsible for the murder of Madeline McCann. So the police say for sure that they believe that Madam Madeline McCann is no longer with us. They were able to say that they had phone evidence that placed him right near the Ocean Club Resort right at the time when Madeline McCann was seemingly abducted. So there is evidence, there is tangible evidence. The German police are 100% sure that they have the man who abducted and murdered Madeline McCann. And I'm sure that is not what the family wanted to hear. And they wanted to find her alive, of course. The parents were buying birthday gifts and Christmas gifts every single year. And I know that they were hoping for her to come home alive, but hopefully this brings some closure and some peace to the family, knowing that at the very least, they got the man who was responsible for taking their daughter away from them. And he will be prosecuted and you know, given the sentence that he deserves for this atrocious act. Okay, you guys, and this is the final look. What do y'all think? I like it. I like a little color every now and then. You know, I like the neutrals. I'm the queen of the neutrals and, you know, muted tones, but I also like a little color. So let me know what you guys think in the comments down below of this week's look. Also, I want to hear y'all sound off about this story. Like, for me, a big part of this, I just couldn't help but feeling like if parenting choices were better, this would not have happened to that poor little girl or their family. I, again, I am not a victim blamer, shamer, any of that, but I just can't get behind leaving my kid alone, sleeping where somewhere that I'm not there or somebody that's responsible and watching them and I trust them is not there. So I think this story is just an overall tragedy and it's a good learning for other people out there. And 
I really want to know what you guys think about it. So let me know in the comments down below. Let me know what you think of the look. In terms of the primer, the Silk Primer Serum from Gucci, just a few thoughts on it. I really like it. I don't get a blurring effect really from it, but I do like that it does pretty well with maintaining, you know, a shine-free look, oil-free look. I look pretty matte. I wasn't expecting that from this particular primer. I was thinking I was going to get more of a like a natural glow kind of look with this primer, but I was pleasantly surprised that it does really well with my oil. Um, like I said, it doesn't do a whole lot of blurring, but I don't see a ton of pores just yet. Um, it's not the best at covering pores either. So, you probably want to go with a different primer if you were looking for something that has that blurring effect. But in terms of smooth application, I didn't get any patchiness, any blotchiness of the, the actual product that I put on after the primer. So nothing broke apart. So it plays really well with other makeup. It does really great for people with oily or combination skin. So I would definitely recommend it for that. But yeah, I, I'm happy with the product. I can't say that it's my favorite yet. This is the first time I've used it. So I'll try it a couple more times and let you guys know if it's up there or not. But yeah, I just wanted to share my quick thoughts on the Gucci Primer Serum. And yeah, that's it. So let me know in the comments down below what you thought of this week's video and this week's look. And you know I'm going to engage with y'all down there. So go ahead and get to typing. And make sure that you subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Make sure that you hit that notification bell as well so that you get notified when I post new goodies. You know you want to know when they come out. So show some love, y'all. Also make sure that you like the video. It's greatly appreciated and it means a ton to me and my channel when you do that. Otherwise, love you guys. Bye.